if you would, grab your Bibles and open it up to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 3. We are navigating and walking through a verse-by-verse, chapter-by-chapter study of this Old Testament book. And we kicked it off a few weeks ago, and two weeks ago, Pastor John walked us through the second chapter Last Sunday, we had the opportunity to kind of hear a special message from a gentleman who's been connected to the life of this church since 1988, uh, a pastor by the name of Randall Gordon Pittman. We just call him Randy, but um, he was here last Sunday. How many of you guys were able to to be here last Sunday with Pastor Randy? Awesome. If you missed it, you're, you're no longer saved, so glad you're here today. No, just kidding. But it was a great message. If you'd like to check it out through all the different mediums, YouTube or, you know, the podcast or something, definitely encourage you to do that. But today we're in the third chapter of Nehemiah. And, and, you know, for me, I just think it's a joy to be able to have a dry, safe place to be able to study the Bible together on a Sunday morning. Um, it's, a, it's a joy. It, it's, it's, and here's another thing. I do think, and maybe you go, what? Are you going to say that? How can you say that? I, I kind of think sometimes that it's a, it's a privilege to be able to be in a place that um, is so well cared for by, by so many, physically and spiritually. Um, and we get to do what we get to do today because there are so many of you that give, that serve, that support the work of Coastline. Um, And so I just want to say thank you for your participation um, in allowing something as simple as this to happen in a dry and safe, but not distraction-free. Sometimes there's distractions, there's phones. Um, But still, there are so many brothers and sisters that we have in Jesus that live in different states of our own country that are not able to do what you're doing right now. For us to be able to say that this time last year, you would have thought, are you crazy? What do you mean? But... Much can change quickly, and um, I'm just thankful to be where we are, doing what we're doing in a way that is, well, to God's glory and the good of others. And so, the book of Nehemiah. You know, it's my hope as a guy who has listened to sermons for my entire life that we together would learn the Bible so that we live the Bible. One of the guys that trained me said, Neil, if you're going to teach expositionally through books of the Bible, you better make sure that, you know, that you represent Jesus well, because every single book is about him. And every time you open that book, if the people that are listening, or even in your own mind, if there's a mist here, there'll be a fog there, they need to see Jesus. They they need to know what this book why some people have given their life so that you could sit here and, and listen to this. They need to know why this piece of literature, a historical piece of literature that is inspired, why it matters, yes, but how it shows us more of Jesus. And if if I may have your attention, if I may have your eyes, here's what I would say. The book of Nehemiah is a testimony to you that Jesus has the ability to rebuild and restore. Because as you navigate life, there will be loss. There will be disappointment. There will be death. There will be. It's what makes life so sweet. Because it could be gone tomorrow. So today is awesome. Because I may, I may not have it tomorrow. So that makes this very precious. Perspective directs activity. 
And this perspective of Nehemiah, I'm hoping today, will just further ingrain in your heart and mind that Jesus rebuilds and restores. And I, and I, you know, I like to keep things as simple as possible. I'm hoping that from February, we're almost done with February, but from February to May, you're awakening to that truth. And that by the time we reach the end of May, you would be able to say in your own life, I can see <laughs> how Jesus has rebuilt over the last four months. We got a new playground. There it is. It's done. We've already accomplished it, right? Like, but seriously, emotionally, relationally, mentally, spiritually, financially, bridgely, if that makes any sense. Like, hopefully there's some rebuilding and restoring that goes on, but only for the initiated. That's how this works. Only for those that are awake, that have been born again, will you get this. This isn't intellectually discerned. This is spiritually applied and understood. Jesus is the central focus of the Bible. Your life is about his story, not yours. And the quicker you align your life with his agenda, the better you'll be. For some of us, that takes time to learn. You mean this book is not all about me? This isn't a promise book that I go to for my troubles? I don't just go like this and go, that's what I'm reading today. No, you don't, because this isn't about you. It's for you, but it was never written to you. This was written to the original audience. So please don't read yourself into the text. But allow the text to show you who Jesus is. And through faith and repentance, align your attitudes, beliefs, choices, decisions, and even experiences to the Father's will. And that'll lead to good. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? That's what it'll do. It'll do that. See, Jesus is the hero of the story. And just like in Nehemiah's day, Jesus has work for you and I to do. You say, what is that work? This is the work of God, that you would believe on him whom he has sent. If you're not there yet, that's the work that God's calling you to right now, today. On February, is it the 28th? Is that today? February 28th? That's the work that God has for you, that you would believe on him whom he sent. And he sent a man named Jesus, his son. This is the work that God has for you. And then he commissions you into a work that he's doing. So what is that? Matthew chapter 28, Mark 16. Jesus partners with men and women to accomplish his work. And Jesus desires, please listen to this because this is what chapter 3 is about in Nehemiah. Jesus desires to partner Every single man, woman, and child who bears the name of Jesus on their soul in the Great Commission. That is your job description. That is your mission, which seems impossible, but should you so choose it, God will do the impossible in and through you. Quite simply, the book of Nehemiah is about the person, the work, and the people of Jesus and today, as we look at chapter 3, let me just remind you of where we are. The story begins in Susa. So where is that? It's about 150 miles north of modern-day Persian Gulf. At the time of the writing, it's the capital of the Persian Empire, which is the America of the day, if you want to look at it that way, the superpower. The time of year is the ninth month meaning November or December, in the, in the calendar. They don't follow an American calendar at this time. The timing of this story is post-exilic. You say, what do you mean? Well, the Old Testament is centered around the Jewish people primarily, and they were brought into exile for disobedience. They, didn't, they, were, they were workaholics. You ever met anyone like that? They didn't rest. And so God said, here's what I'm going to do. You will rest. You will let the, the land rest. And for every year that you ripped off the land, you're going into captivity. That's what happened to the people of Israel. Sound like any other culture you know of. 
where the man in command is the man in demand. <laughs> that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. But like, but that's the culture of this day of the people of God. They saw work as identity, not work as worship of God. There are some among us who are still navigating that. The timing of this story is that the Jews are returning back to their homeland. And you're catching it in kind of that story of the return of the Jedi. Say, what do you mean? Well, a new hope already happened. What was the second one? Something about like the empire strikes back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it was. And then the last one was the return of the Jedi. Why are you saying that? Well, because there were three stages. There was like Zerubbabel, Ezra, and now Nehemiah. That's where we are in this story. We're in the third act of this kind of return to Jerusalem. And in chapter 1, we navigated in verses 5 through 11 this reality that for Nehemiah, it was about a relationship with God, not a religious experience about God. Because if you read Nehemiah chapter 1, that's what's happening there. He's talking to God. We also saw that when Nehemiah didn't know what to do, when he heard about what was going on in his homeland, he did what he knew to do. He prayed. He fasted. And also in Nehemiah chapter 1, we learn that it's more about our availability to God than it is our ability. That's chapter 1. Chapter 2, where we left off a couple weeks ago, four months passed between chapter 1 and chapter 2. And we know from chapter 1 and chapter 2 that Nehemiah is a guy that actually like could have been on the cover of GQ. Say, what do you mean? He's a cupbearer. Well, how do we know he's... Listen, if you were in the king's presence, you had to look good, smell good, sound good, and be good. You know what I mean? Always be like smiling because we don't, we don't want to have sadness in the king's presence. This is what that means. That man knew how to set aside emotion and get the job done. This isn't like a guy that's like, I feel like, you know, he's not like that kind of guy, right? This is a guy that's a guy. He's not a boy that shaves. He, he, he's a guy that like, I got a job to do. I'm going for it. Doesn't matter how I feel, I'm there. That's who Nehemiah is. His job description lends us to infer that. This is a dude. This is a man's man, so to speak, potentially. I haven't met him yet, but when I do, I'll, I'll ask him. But. And as the king's cupbearer, he was positioned, not by his own hand, but by the hand of the sovereign, that he was the right person in the right place at the right time. And the king asked him in chapter 2 why he was so sad, and this was his moment. To either blow it or move forward. This was his moment. And Nehemiah goes for it. He shares about the ruin of his homeland. He shares his plan to rebuild and even maybe get some letters from the king so he can gain favor and in passage into the land. And Nehemiah moves forward. And here's what happens. Please don't miss this. This is always what happens. When the heart, head, and hands align with the Father. God begins to bless. The work starts to come together. The people are starting to assemble. A team is being built. And then this always happens. Death. Struggle. Testing. Crucible. A.W. Tozer once said this, that before God can use a person greatly, he must wound them deeply. Because you must know that without God, there's nothing there. And Nehemiah starts to experience opposition. Look at Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 16 through 20. In fact, I'm going to ask you to stand as I read this this morning, because this text will give context to all of chapter 3. Because if you haven't read chapter 3, you're in for a treat. But Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 16 through 20, reading from the New Living Translation, this is what the author writes. The city officials did not know that I had been out there or what I was doing. 
For I had not yet said anything to anyone about my plans. I had not yet spoken to the Jewish leaders, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or anyone else in the administration. But now I said to them in verse 17, you know very well what trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. Then I told them about how gracious the hand of God had been on me and about my conversation with the king, and they replied at once, yes, let's rebuild the wall. So they began the good work. Then verse 19, the struggle, the crucible, the death, the challenge. But then when Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem the Arab heard of our plan, they scoffed contemptuously. What are you doing? Insinuation. Are you rebelling against the king, they asked. And I replied, the God of heaven will help us succeed. We, his servants, will start rebuilding this wall. But you have no share, legal right, or historic claim in Jerusalem. Father, we pray as we now step into chapter 3 that you'd give wisdom and insight, clarity, both, Lord, individually in specificity, but also, Lord, in community, just collaboratively, Lord, just speak to us as we study now the third chapter of the book of Nehemiah. May you have your will and your way in our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. In Nehemiah chapter 3 this morning, we are going to look at all 32 verses of the chapter. And you said, Neil, you've been speaking for 18 minutes and 40 seconds. Like, how can you do that? Well, it's going to be okay. In Nehemiah chapter 3, if you have pen or a mobile device where you would like to make note of this, this is what I would say we see this morning. Three Ps to help us remember. In Nehemiah chapter 3, we are going to see the people, the people that God uses. Number two, we'll have a little bit of insight into the process of the work. And then number three, this is kind of a cheating way to do this, but it works. The profound application to our lives. It's kind of an adjective, it's not really a noun, but it's still a P. The people, the process, and the profound application. Now, how many of you guys have ever read Nehemiah chapter 3 before? Or Matthew chapter 1, or maybe Luke chapter 1. Anyone ever read those awesome passages of Scripture? Can anyone shout out to me what there's a lot of? It starts with an N, it ends with an S, and it rhymes with names. Names, yes, you guys know. You've read Nehemiah chapter 3, good job. There's a lot of names, a lot of names. And it is a tendency for many to potentially just go, well, let's just kind of skip that chapter. You know, there's a lot of names in there. I don't really know why that's in there. If God, this is God breathe, this seems like God's boring list. Like, what is going on here? Like, well, no, it matters. It matters. And today I want to share why, but I don't want to do it alone. Say, what do you mean? Well, Rob Gilliard is here. Rob's going to come up to the stage, and Rob is our worship leader and recently has stepped into a role of communications director. So, not yesterday, but sometime this morning, I said, Rob, here's what we're going to do today. I would like for us to identify six individuals to read God's Word in church. How many of you guys are okay with God's Word being read in church? Cool. Back, oh, back row's even cool with it for the most part. Um. Well, Rob has identified six individuals who are going to be reading through, in totality, verses 1 through 32 of Nehemiah. Now, I'm going to ask for your grace, because this, believe it or not, Nehemiah chapter 3 isn't a bestseller of baby names. You know what I mean? Like, some of these names are like, whoa, who is that? That's why I'm not reading them, right? Like, let the other six read them, right? But, um, but with that being said... Uh, Rob knows what to do now. I don't know what to do. I know that we have some scriptures to read, and Rob has it organized. So Rob is going to basically take it from here and identify the next reader. It looks like Ben Wadvogel is our first reader, so we're going to give the mic to Ben Wadvogel. Can you give Ben Wadvogel a nice welcome as he shares? You just step right on that rug. 
Then Eliashiv, the high priest, and the other priests started to rebuild at the Sheep Gate. They dedicated it and set up its doors, building the wall as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated, and the Tower of Hananel. The people of the town of Jericho worked next to them, and beyond them was Zakur, son of Imri. The fish gate was built by the sons of Hassanah. They laid the beams, set up its doors, and installed its bolts and bars. Miramoth, the son of Uriah and grandson of Hakoz, prepared the next section of wall. Beside him were Meshulam, son of Berkiah, and grandson of Meshazabel, and then Zodok, son of Banah. Next were the people from Tekoa, though their leaders refused to work with the construction supervisors. I will not be near as eloquent. <laughs> Verse 6, the old city gate was repaired by Joedah, son of Pesah, and Meshelam, son of Besadai. They laid the beams, set up the doors, and installed its bolts and bars. Next to them were Meladia from Gibeon, Jadon and Moranath, people from Gibeon, people from Mizpah, the headquarters of the governor of the prince west of the Euphrates. Next was Uziel, son of Harahai, a goldsmith by trade who also worked on the wall. Beyond him was Hanani, and a manufacturer of perfumes. They left out a section of Jerusalem as they built the, the broad wall. Rephaiah, son of Hur, the leader of half of the district of Jerusalem, was next to him on the wall. Next, Jediah, son of Hermaph, repaired the wall across from his own house. And next to him was Hattush, son of Hashbani. Then M, son of H, and H, son of R, <laughs> or son of P, who repaired another section of the wall and the tower of the ovens. Shalom, son of Helohesh, and his daughters repaired the next section. He was the leader of the other half of the district of Jerusalem. The valley gate was repaired by the people of Zenoa, led by Hanan. They set up its doors and installed its bolts and bars. They repaired the 1,500 feet of the wall of the dung gate. The dung gate was repaired by Malkiah, son of Rechab, the leader of the of the Beth Hakarim district. He rebuilt it, set up its doors, and installed its bolts and bars. The foundation gate was repaired by Shalem, son of Kol Hazoah, the leader of the Mizpah district. He rebuilt it, roofed it, set up its doors, and installed its bolts and bars. Then he repaired the wall of the pool of Siloam near the king's garden, and he rebuilt the wall as far as the stairs that descend from the city of David. Next to him was Nehemiah, son of Az Azbuk, the leader of the half district of Beth Zur. He rebuilt the wall from a place across from the tombs of David's family as far as the water reservoir and the house of the warriors. Next to him, repairs were made by a group of Levites, working under the supervision of Rahum, son of Bani. Then came Hashabiah, the leader of half the district of Keilah, who supervised the building of the wall on behalf of his own district. Next down the line were his countrymen, led by Benui, son of Henadad, the leader of the other half of the district of Keilah. Next to them, Ezer, son of Jeshua, the leader of Mizpah, repaired another section of the wall across from the ascent to the armory near the angle in the wall. Next to him was Barak, son of Zabai, who zealously repaired an additional section from the angle to the door of the house of Elisha, the high priest, Merimuth, son of Uriah and grandson of Haggis, rebuilt another section of the wall, extending from the door of Elisha's house to the end of the house. The next repairs were made by the priests from the surrounding region. After then, Benjamin and Haseb, Haseb repaired the section across from their house. And Azariah, son of Maaseah, and grandson of Ananiah, repaired the section across from his house. 
Next uh, was Benai, son of Henadad, who rebuilt another section of the wall from Azariah's house to the angle and the corner. Palau, son of Uzziah, carried on the work from a point opposite of the angle and the tower that protects up from the king's upper house beside the court of the guard. Next to him were Padiah, 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 son of Parosh, and um, with the temple servants living on the hill of Ophel, who repaired the wall as far as the point across from the water gate to the east of the projecting tower. Then came the people of Tekoa, who repaired another section across from the great projecting tower and over the wall of Ophel. Above the horse gate, the priests repaired the wall. Each one repaired the section immediately across from his own house. Next, Zadok, son of Imer, also rebuilt the wall across from his own house. And beyond him was Shemah, son of Sakshia, the gatekeeper of the east gate. Next, Heniah, son of Shilamah, and Hanun, the sixth son of Zalapah, repaired another section while Malushiam, son of Berika, rebuilt the wall across from where he lived. Malikiah, one of the goldsmiths, repaired the wall as far as the housing from the temple servants and merchants, across from the inspection gate. Then he continued as far as the upper room at the corner. The other goldsmith and merchants repaired the wall from the corner to the sheep gate. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, Nehemiah may be the name that is often remembered. However, as you see, many names are recorded because it's not about one person other than the person of Jesus. That, that's what this book and every other book, the other 65 books that make up the canon of the Bible, show us that we're all passing through. Life is like a mist. It's like a fog. Hopefully it'll be gone soon, right? Not, not, not your life, the fog, right? Like, hopefully it'll be, go, it'll be over in a minute, but like, but that's quickly how fast and it goes that way. It does when you begin to add children or life experiences to your years. It seems like the accelerator accelerates. And it's hard to see that when you're 12. But when you're 22, you kind of see it. 32, you go, oh, maybe, maybe a little, yeah, kind of. 42, well, it's almost over. Like, it's what it feels like. Like, and then it's just keeping going, you know? Here's the interesting thing I find about the people 38 individuals are named in this chapter, 42 different groups are identified, and there are even many that Nehemiah don't name, but they're assigned to a work. There were a lot of people involved. If I could give you a supplemental resource to read, I'd love to recommend Be Determined by Warren Wearsby. Some of our connect groups, small groups that are meeting in, during the week are using this as a, you know, just kind of like a help if they're uh, navigating in their group a biblical conversation of what was learned on Sunday. This is a great tool. You know Why? Because it has application questions in the back and the answers are in the chapter. I love those kind of books where it's like, that's where it is. But in the chapter about Nehemiah chapter 3, Warren Wearsby, who's at home to be with the Lord, wrote this, quoting D.L. Moody. He says this, A great many people have got a false idea about the church. They have got an idea that the church is a place to rest in, to get into a nicely cushioned seat and contribute to the giving or charities, listen to the minister, and do their share to keep the church out of bankruptcy. That's all they want. The idea of work for them, actual work in church, 
never enters their minds. That, that, that church is more kind of like McDonald's. Well, maybe not McDonald's. It's closed in Gulf Breeze proper. Let's think of another place. Santino's. That's a cool place. Like you go there and like, I'm here to get a grinder. I'm here to get a pizza. And then I'm here to leave. Uh, no, that's not what the church is. The church is a community. If you'd like an illustration, look at a family. So I had a broken image of family. Get in line. So does every other human. No, no human has an ideal family situation. You know why? Because it's made up of humans. And there is no ideal human. Every human is flawed. We say, well, my situation is worse than this situation. Let me be honest with you. If you go down that trail, you will find that there's always someone who has it better and always someone who has it worse. So just own who you are. Own it. You didn't control to whom you were born, where you were born, or when you were born, but somebody did. And I believe that person, who is named God, is bigger than the failings of your father. I believe that sovereign being can take ashes and rebuild and restore. I believe that many of us have cousins and aunties and uncles and grandmothers and grandfathers and fathers and daughters and sons and brothers and sisters and whatever the name is that you would say, well, well, I'm this way because of that. And Jeremiah would say to you, stop saying my teeth are set on edge because my parents ate sour grapes. Meaning, own who you are. It is a tragedy that we live in a world filled with sin. But you're not unique in that. We all navigate that to one degree or another. And the blood of Jesus is able to forgive and empower you to forgive if you so should choose. See, the church is like a family. And this, I don't know if you've learned this about a family. Maybe it was just illustrated, but there's no perfect family. And then there is no perfect church. I know you don't believe this because the, the previous lead pastor of 38 years was pretty close to perfect. But there's no perfect pastor, if you believe that or not. Like, some of us don't have as much hair as the previous pastor. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, this is just the way it works here. There is no ideal. It's not heaven until it's heaven. So stop looking for heaven on earth. There is no forever home. Stop using that language. There, there's one forever home. And you're not in it. We are a family. In our family, we have five children with a soon-to-be sixth. All of my kids have a job description. They all have expectations just because they exist. Does that make sense? Like, you live here, so we got to work together because there's more kids coming and we can't be doing everything. Like, you got to help, you know? Um, that's how that works. A lot of people go, you're nuts to have that many. I say you're nuts to not because as they get older, they produce a lot. Like, that's my retirement plan, all those kids. <laughs> Like, one of them is bound to be successful. The odds are in my favor. Like, they're just, like, there's more and more coming. So, like, I'm not as crazy as you think. Like, you know. I'm telling you, it's the best investment possible is humans. Anyway, I'll, it's also the most risky. But anyway, all that to say, it takes a team. It takes a family. And it takes, let me say this, let me have your attention, let me have your eyes. It takes everyone doing their part. Well, 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 this is what I find so interesting, though. Warren Wearsby does a better job than I will be able to explain this. On page 48, he, he kind of shows that he uses all kinds of people, that there's some leaders who actually lead by the grace of God. But here's the other thing, that there's some in here that won't work. You know who they are? They're, they're kind of like, and I'm just going to say this, because that's what's happening. They're the privileged. They don't work in, in this chapter. 
you're going to find out that as we navigate this, this book together, that there are these people that feel privileged and they don't work as hard. Because success often ruins people. And privilege is not necessarily an asset. Many situations, it's a liability. Especially with raising children. But all kinds of people. Leaders who actually lead, some leaders who don't, some who do more work than others, and some who work harder than others. Have you ever experienced that in a job or like in a family or in a church? Oh man, you guys are all part of the ideal. I want to hang out with you. Like, that's been my experience. Dude, there's some people that are lazy. There's some people that are workaholics. There's some people that for them, work is their identity. But you must learn that work is worship. It's how you glorify God and bring good to others. These are the people. A ragtag group of ragamuffins, if you want to use that terminology. That's who we are. Nobody here is, is ideal. We're all still in process. Every single one of us. We're all sinners saved by grace. There's one guy that was like, that's the guy. That guy, he beat death. That's the guy we should listen to. His name's Jesus. He's got a book, bestseller every year. You know what I mean? Like, listen to him. The people, the process, the word build or rebuild, honestly, the better translation, is used six times in this chapter. The word repair or restore is used 35 See, I'm not that smart. Jesus rebuilds and restores. It's right there. Like, I'm just telling you, this is what it is. The workstations, the gates of the wall are being focused on in, in, in this third chapter here. There's 11 in totality. And, and Warren Wearsby gives great insight into the spiritual illustrations of that. And man, I would just encourage you to pick up this book on Amazon or, you know, wherever and just like, hey, it's awesome. There's like 18 sermons in Nehemiah chapter 3. It's awesome. But we just don't have time for that. But it's fascinating. And I hope that you're in a connect group where you can kind of have dialogue about this. Because this is more of a monologue. But I hope you can sink your teeth into this. And this will really help. This little be determined situation here. But that's the people. That's the process. And then for the profound application, I'd like for you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I don't have time to read the entirety of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, but let me just read a couple verses. And in fact, if Rob's still around and the, the musician team, the band, I'm going to go ahead and invite you guys up so we can begin to kind of wrap this up. But in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, reading from the New Living Translation, this is what the guy named Saul, who transferred his name to Paul, the, the Christian killer, turned into the Christian discipler, wrote, The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up the whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. If I had time and opportunity to read all the way through the end of the chapter, I would. But listen to this phrase one more time from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. And you know what this is like. I know what it's like having 20 years of vascular reflux disease. When there's one part of your body that's not firing like it should, it impacts the rest of your body. And the longer that happens, the worse it impacts the rest of your body. We know that, and we don't have to go through all the ailments that we all experience at whatever age and stage of life we're in. But we know that if the pinky hurts, it's like the whole body hurts. Like, oh, man, all I can think about is the pinky. You know what I mean? Like, that's the way it works. But there's so much more to share about the implications of the fact that you are a part of the body of Christ. And this is the thing I want to share this book shows us Jesus, that he's the one that rebuilds and restores. This book in totality will, will show us clearly by the time we hit May that, listen, it's all about Jesus. You know, it's not just one chapter, it's all 13 that kind of come together like a mosaic to go, look at what this shows us about our Savior, that Jesus came from heaven to earth to show the way. 
He went from the earth to the cross, our debt to pay. He went from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, so that we, through our lives, would lift him on high. That's the message of the Bible. And all of us, let me have your attention, let me have your eyes. Every single one of us, whether you've been born again or not, whether you identify as Christian or unchristian, saved or unsaved, listen to me. You are in a tight spot. Right now you are. You say, what do you mean? I'm, I'm saved. Yes. If you're a Christian, that means God has solved your spiritual problem. You can't do it. Jesus did it. If you're an unchristian, then you still got a problem, man. Like it's a spiritual problem that you can't solve. You must turn in faith and repentance to Jesus because he's the one that solves the problem. But listen to me. You're in a tight spot. You say, what does that mean? Well, this is what I mean by that. God has given you a relationship of partnership with him. Where you, empowered by God's spirit, in alignment with God's word, in community with God's people, balance spiritual health every single day through your attitudes, through your beliefs, through your choices, through your decisions, through your example, even through your experiences, those all add up to this equation, faithfulness or failure by God's Spirit, not by your bootstraps. But I know what you believe. Your attitude shows me. I know what you believe. Look at your choices. Look at your decisions. Look at the experiences of the last six months. This is who you are. And the choice is fruitfulness or fruitlessness according to the grid that matters. Not this grid. Not, not the world standards. Listen, stop storing up treasures where moth and rust and COVID destroy. Store up treasures where neither moth nor rust nor disease nor hurricane can take away. And I'm telling you, life is almost over. You don't know that you have tomorrow. What is your today look like? Are you leaning back or leaning in? Where is the attitude of your heart? What are the choices that you're making? What are you investing in? I want you to do well. And within me and within you are the seeds of fruitfulness and failure. Does that mean we lose our salvation? No, God's got us. But can I ask you a question? Don't you want to like do well? Like experience love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. That there is an element of that that's your partnership with God's spirit. You cannot do what D.L. Moody says here. I'm just going to kind of sit back in a nice chair. Listen to the minister. Maybe give a little bit. And that's what church is. Wake up. Wake up. That's not church. That's Santino's. You know what I'm saying? Like, that, that's what that is. This is not a place where you receive a spiritual good and then go do what you think you should do. This is a community to be a part of. So what are you all about? <laughs> I tried to clarify it the best I know how. That we're about new life in Jesus. We're about gatherings that are fostering a love relationship to God. Called a worship gathering. We're about a group where you build connection and community with one another. That's scary if you're not there. Because you live in the most disconnected generation. And where you're actually living on purpose. That's what this is. And you may say, I don't know where to start. Start with Jesus. Get to know him. You say, I know Jesus. Here's your next step. Profess Jesus through baptism. Lord willing, our next baptism is on Easter Sunday. If you've not been baptized, this is your year. You may not have next year. You never know. COVID might be coming again. You know what I mean? Like, this is the time. Register for that. And you may say, but I don't know how to move forward personally. I tried to develop a tool that helps with that called Story and Dream. Now listen, this isn't on me to help you with your story and dream. Listen to me, they have your eyes. You're responsible for you. You are. You, you will stand before God. And you won't be able to say, well, my dad or my parents or my pastor or the place I lived. or No. 
is, is you. And this is the beautiful thing about being a Christian. If you're a Christian, God will look at you and say, ah, you're the one that's covered by my son. Come on in. It's not about, well, I had a bad attitude that day. No, Jesus has got you covered. You're in here. You're in here. You're in here. But for those of you that have walked with the Lord for a while, please don't forget about the Bema seat. Paul lived for it. Running a race. Against one another? No, 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 no. The world, the flesh, and the devil, those are your enemies. There's no human enemy. There's a spiritual one. There's a fleshly one. There's a worldly one. So invest your attitude, belief, choices, decisions, and experiences, and events in that which matters. If you don't know where to start, see Tabitha. Tabitha has the answers to everything. She's got a place at the Connect desk where she can say, well, this magazine may help. Maybe try this tool, but here's what I'm going to tell you even beyond that. Who cares about that stuff? It's about the gospel. It's about Jesus stepping into your mess and saying, I can forgive, but you must receive him. You must recognize that you're a sinner. You must realize that he's the only way forward. You must repent of your sins and receive Jesus. Alliteration, man, it's always a part of my life, but like those four R's, recognize, realize, repent, and receive new life in Jesus. If you don't know that you're a Christian today, but you'd like to, after the service, Pastor John will be here. I'll be here. We'd love to talk to you. Be like, well, I would like to talk to someone in the foyer. Talk to Tabitha. She'd love to talk to you about that. We have a Bible in the foyer that we'd love to give you. If you say, I, I need to know like, how to live, start reading God's word. Surrender to him. This book is actually a, a talking book. It's living and active. And if your heart is open, he will speak to you. Here's the last thing I'll say. Here's the thing about God. God doesn't need me, but he wants me. I'm so thankful for that. And you may say, okay, 1 Corinthians 12, is this kind of a pitch because the church needs me? Let me share something with you. The church doesn't need you, but we want you. Does that make sense? The church doesn't rise and fall on your shoulders or mine. This is Jesus' church, and he wants you to be a part of it. I don't know that God has need. Does that make sense? Like, oh, I hope, man, I hope Joe Prestridge shows up today. I hope Terry shows up. It just won't function without him. No, <laughs> this is about Jesus. But boy, we want Joe Prestridge, right? We want Terry. We want everybody. But it rises and falls on the one who conquered death. It does not rise and fall on my shoulders. If it did, be worried. That's all I got to say. Because the shoulders of Jesus, the one who said, I will build my church, is ever faithful, ever true, ever dependable, and he is the ideal. He is the ideal. So let the church be all, only, and always about Jesus, for it's his bride, his body. It's his temple, and our lives are lived unto him. Let's stand together.